scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. Everybody, thank you so much, Apostle Felix, and we honor our Father. Thank you so much and our Mother. In the name of Jesus Christ. We'll go straight to the business of the morning. This is only the first session. Can we lift up our voices in one minute and ask the Lord to speak to us again? Speak to us again. Let your word come with power. Let it come with grace. Someone pray. My Bible says they go from strength to strength. As many as appear before the Lord in Zion. Father, give me an encounter this morning. Grant me access to your wisdom, access to your power, access to your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you and we honor you this morning. We ask that you will speak to us, challenge our hearts, position us to manifest in your power and your glory, even in higher dimensions. And to Jesus be all the glory. Amen and amen. Please be seated. God bless you. Yesterday we began... A teaching series that will end tonight commission with power and I said a few things yesterday I have a very brief time this morning so I'll just go straight um, but then just as a reminder that God's intent and God's ordination for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is that we be a people of power a people of wisdom, a people of grace. Remember that? That the destiny of the church in Christ is glory. The Bible says that the entire journey of the believer should end up in glory. That means regardless at what point you start with God, as he transits you through the various phases of your life and your experience with him, that if you walk in keeping with the spirit of the Lord, the end of it will be glory. Hallelujah. But then we also said according to Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says that we do not yet see all things under his feet. So in as much as that is God's desire for us, we have not yet come into the experience of that dominion. The experience of uh, that state in the spirit where we manifest his life, his power, his wisdom, his grace to his satisfaction. And I did tell us that this conference is a journey helping us to understand the factors that have hindered us from stepping to that dimension of dominion. I identified three of those factors yesterday why the church the current state of the church in terms of its powerlessness and its inability to rise to a prophetic destiny number one 
we said that there is the absence, insufficient revelation of who we truly are in light of who Christ is. That the first major problem with the church that is responsible for her current state is that there is a bankruptcy of revelation. There is an awareness of who we are, but there is hardly a revelation of who we are. Who we are in light of who Christ is. Number two, we said that there is a bankruptcy of the revelation of our corporate mandate, our corporate purpose, our corporate commission. We have the knowledge of our individual visions, our individual assignments, but as a, as a body, the average believer cannot articulate with intelligence the corporate mandate of the church. That would be my emphasis for this morning. And then number three, that there is the absence of the knowledge of the resources that we have in Christ alongside the dynamics of activating them in our lives. The Bible lets us know that the believer is not left weak and powerless. There are immense spiritual resources that have been accorded the believer through Christ and in Christ. Ephesians 1.3, it says that God has granted us access to all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. But remember our scripture yesterday that man that is in honor and does not know, does not understand, will be like a beast that perishes. Hallelujah. And so my sessions are an attempt to answer these questions to help us understand, number one, who we are in light of who Christ is. Number two, our corporate mandate as God's people. And then number three, to help provide an understanding of the vastness, the resources that have been given to us in Christ. I like the way Paul put it. Ephesians 1 and verse 19. He says, among the many things he prayed that the church would come into the knowledge of was the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe. The exceeding greatness of his power. Hallelujah. So we'll take part two this morning very quickly. Commission with power. We're looking at the mandate, our corporate mandate. Hallelujah. Now, every right and every, every privilege in the kingdom was supposed to be taught in connection to responsibilities. Every right and every privilege that has been given to the believer was never supposed to be taught in isolation to responsibility. When you mentor believers to understand their right in Christ, their privileges in Christ, and you do not connect that understanding to responsibility, you will produce a weak and an irresponsible people. This has been the case. So many believers have a fair understanding of their rights and their responsibilities, but they do not know to what end those rights or their privileges. They do not know to what end those rights were given. Purpose, I wrote here, is what gives value and perspective to every gift and every blessing. Let me take it again. Purpose is what gives value and perspective to every gift and every blessing in the kingdom. That means no matter what it is that you have that constitutes an advantage in your life, in itself, it cannot be seen as value until it is connected to purpose. Are we together now? Yes. Purpose bigger than that individual. So that means everything God gives you, provided it is still within the frame of yourself, it cannot bring you fulfillment. When you look at a mango tree and an orange tree, it does not get fulfillment from eating itself or its fruit. Are we together? It goes through all that labor of development and then the joy of it 
is that people come and enjoy what has come out from it. So this is how God designed us to function. It's important you know this. So everything God gave you, whatever it is that you know in your life that constitutes an advantage. And by the way, let me encourage you, it is not pride to acknowledge all that God has given you. Philemon 1 and verse 6 says that the communication of your faith might be effectual through the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ. The acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ. Hallelujah. So, it's important for us to acknowledge all that God has given, all that God has made of us. But then for you to know that nothing in itself finds fulfillment except it is used as a tool to serve a cause greater than itself. So when God anoints you, he anoints you for the nations. Esther, when God grants you access to beauty, it is beyond just getting to the palace. There is a mission connected to it. So if your beauty ends up in your being queen alone, you are bought at destiny. It must translate you from a queen to a deliverer. Are we together now? So it's important for us to know this because this in itself is a deliverance for someone. A reorientation. So every time we say give me, there is a question from heaven. What for? give me in the teaching of the lord's prayer when jesus christ was teaching us the pattern for productive prayer because you see in luke's synoptic account his teaching on prayer came as an answer to a request the disciples said teach us to pray as john taught his disciples so their issue was not prayerlessness their issue was ineffective prayer Something about the, the prayer of Jesus was so potent. And then Jesus began to teach them to pray. And in order of priority, here's what he said. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is done in heaven. Now with respect to that agenda, give us this day our daily bread. For the sake of your kingdom. Forgive us our trespasses for the sake of your kingdom. Lead us not into temptation for the sake of your kingdom. Deliver us from evil for the sake of your kingdom. Are we together now? That was the missing ingredient that John did not teach his people. He taught them to pray. But the reason why their prayers were ineffective is that it was not connected to kingdom come. It was a, a communication of isolated desires with no purpose connected to it. Are you understanding me this morning? Yeah. In the body of Christ, there has been many pursuits, many desires, many acquisitions that ended up destroying people because it was not connected to purpose. There are many people, their destruction started officially when they prospered. There are many people, their destruction started officially when they became aware of the vast resources within their reach. They were better off in ignorance. Because now that they had come into an awareness of this truth, because it was not connected to purpose, they became an easy prey. The one thing Solomon forgot was purpose and it ruined every other thing he had his confession was documented in the book of ecclesiastes everything my eyes saw i desired and he got to a point where he was so frustrated he said of reading many books there is no end and much study is a weariness to the soul here is the conclusion of the matter fear god and keep his commandments he said for this is the whole duty of man are we together? So I need to emphasize this because we're examining why the church seems powerless and why it looks like there is a restraint from the spirit in granting us access to these weightier dimensions of glory. 
There is a reason why. Because God will not continue to invest his resources upon a people who are not driven by purpose. It takes us going past the realm of zeal and desire. Purpose is what gives perspective to everything. Are we learning already? Yeah. So, we have individual assignments. And I can tell you that we have done well in identifying our individual assignments. But my, my job this morning is by the Spirit of God to reveal to us the corporate mandate of the church. The corporate mandate of the church. It's important for us to know that as a people, we have a corporate mandate and that what we call our individual visions whether as business people as ministers of the gospel should be derived as a subset of that corporate mandate so as i read out for you the corporate mandate of the church you will use that corporate mandate to verify what you now call the vision of your church or the vision of your business and if it is in defiance to that corporate mandate, then you need to go for a retreat. Because I can assure you already that you will not secure God's backing over any vision and any mandate that is not connected to the corporate mandate of the church. Are we learning this morning? I know that this is a session that is tailor-made for business people and leaders, but I think this is a good start. Before we begin to talk about all the components that help us to succeed and to thrive in the marketplace or in ministry it's important for us to be restored to vision every blind person in the bible that jesus met he insisted that their eyes open there were other miracles that didn't seem to happen but not the the issue of blindness to a point that he laid hands a second time because he wanted clarity of vision. What do you now see? I see men, but like trees. No, I did not create men like trees. You have to see again. So just because you are seeing, we need to verify what you are seeing. He told Jeremiah, he said, what seest thou? And he says, I see the rod of an almond tree. And he says, you have seen correctly. So the problem is not seeing. You can see, but you can see men like trees. And then create a textbook that says men are trees. From the lens of that aberration. So God is giving us clarity of vision this morning. Hmm. Are we blessed? You see why it's good to come to church? You always live wiser. Yes. Always. Always. John 1, 6 and 7, John chapter 1, the Bible says there was a man. There was a man. It's like telling you a story and it's a story story. There was a man. But this man was sent from God. And when he arrived on earth, they named him John was never his name. It was a means of identification when he arrived here. The Bible simply says there was a man. This man, he never mentions Zechariah. He never mentions the mother, Elizabeth. He just tells us there was a man sent from God. And when he arrived the earth, they named him John. This is why he came. Verse 7. Give us verse 7. The same came for a witness. He didn't come to prophesy. He didn't come to baptize. Prophecy and baptism were only a means to help him become this witness. Are we together now? The Bible says the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. That through that witness, all men might believe. 
So you would look at John. Some called him a prophet. In fact, the Bible tells us that he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Then he began to baptize and he was called the Baptist like you are called the businessman. So now you have been beguiled by the geography of your assignment and you forgot who you are and you now call yourself a businessman. But in the mind of God, you were not sent to the earth as a businessman. No. A businessman has become the platform that gives perspective and it gives you room to bear witness to the light. Are we together? So, when you meet a terrorist in a medical class, you call him a doctor in training, then he laughs at you. He knows he's not a doctor. He knows he's a terrorist. But that the nature of his assignment demands that he passes through the medical school to have access to the resources that kill. So he sits in the class with everyone. And while you are teaching him anatomy and physiology, and to you, you think you are training a medical doctor. But the man knows that he's a terrorist. And he will be patient for 10 years. Then you call him Dr. XYZ. Then the medical council certifies him and he says, now get out of the way. I have access to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That means there are two regalias that everyone must wear. Number one is the regalia of a witness. Then number two, the regalia of the platform that helps you to be a witness. Are we together now? This is very important. Because many people, we call ourselves preachers. Then we call ourselves businessmen. Then we call ourselves politicians. Then we call ourselves, help me, professionals. And from an earth standpoint, we are right. Except that marking from an eternal standpoint, that is a very poor understanding of ourselves. You are not a businessman. You do business. You are not a preacher. You preach. Now, I'm not saying go around harassing people. You get what we're saying now. No. This is the reason why they met Jesus and said, Who are you? Some say you are Elijah because we see an element of Elijah's manifestation in your life. They were trying to identify him using the geography of his witness. Some say you are this, you are that. We see the prophetic in you. We see this other dimension. Then you speak, we call you rabbi. You've never said we're wrong in any of these things. Who are you? And I hope you know it was an intelligent man who was asking that question. Yeah. Most people failed in calling him his name it was one person who got it by the spirit he said i know who thou art you are not a carpenter's son you are not a teacher even though you teach you are not a healer even though you heal he says thou art christ the son of the living god finally someone would get it right and then jesus said flesh and blood has not revealed this to you simon but jonah but the spirit of my father and he says upon this revelation i will build my church what revelation first the revelation of my lordship and that i am lord and christ but in addition to it i will build the church with this understanding that your geography does not define you your occupation does not define you Hallelujah. Don't tempt me. I'm walking with time. Our father has to come up here. Hallelujah. Now listen to me. The corporate mandate of the church is a threefold mandate. I plead with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Please listen very carefully. Your life will change magically so 
if you understand what I'm about to share with you now, there is a threefold mandate that was given to every and to all believers. It's been captured in a concept that has been known today to the church as the Great Commission. Listen, unfortunately, and with all due respect to the body theological institutions, I have searched for a concise and an intelligent presentation of the Great Commission and I have found it wanting on many grounds. What we have proposed as the Great Commission has come with many, many elements of inaccuracy. It is the reason why believers have been confused. The average believer understands the Great Commission as soul winning. That is not wrong, but it is grossly incomplete. Are we together now? So whether you are a missionary, whether you are a businessman, you are a politician, a diplomat, a professional, a parent, I'm reading for you this creed that binds us all. It is on account of this that we can come together and worship. I can't come into the court of law and sit on the seat of the judge. I do not have that qualification. I cannot go into a surgical room even though I'm an anointed man. Maybe to pray, but not to perform any surgery. But we can all come together in the house of God because there is a corporate mandate that gives everybody an invitation. Are we together? There are three scriptures in the Bible very quickly that must be examined in understanding the corporate mandate of the church. Three scriptures. And if you isolate any of this scripture and teach from, you will communicate imbalance. The scriptures have to come together to produce a holistic picture of the corporate mandate. Scripture number one, very quickly. Mark 16, 15, please. Mark 16, 15. Please, let's rush. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Reading to 20. 17 now, 16. He says, He that believe, please go back to 16, and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned or condemned. 17. These signs shall follow them that believe as they go. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Hallelujah. The Bible says, so after the Lord had spoken. So who spoke to them? The Lord. So we're not in doubt. If he was a prophet, we'll say he did not hear well. But it was the Lord himself giving this commission. The Bible says he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. The last scripture. It says, so in obedience to that commission, they went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now, most people have taught the Great Commission just from that scripture. That is the reason why everybody wants to be a preacher. Because our understanding is that if I have to obey God, the only thing I have to do to show that I'm serious with God is to get into pulpit ministry. And so our pulpits are full of people who have no business getting there. But it, listen, it was not just materialism. It was that there is no other way. There is a hunger in them to be part of God's program. And since they have been ill-mentored to believe that the only way to be part of God's program based on this scripture is to go forth and preach. So inventors have become preachers. Scientists have become preachers. And that is the reason why there is a lot of inefficiency on the altar. Scripture number two. Matthew 28. 18 to 20. Matthew 28. This is another component of the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spake unto them saying, All authority, we looked at this yesterday, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. 19 go ye therefore and teach in mark's account he said preach to preach means to declare 
to announce to proclaim in preaching you do not edit the message the goal of preaching is awareness the goal of teaching is understanding if i send you and say go and tell apostle felix i am around that message does not need creativity just go and declare it as it is are we together now but if i say go and help this person drive now you have to bring in all the creative resources within your power because that will have to be per person there are many factors you have to examine he says go therefore and teach all nations there are many teachers here and you know that in teaching people there are many things you have to examine their culture their level of exposure their level of understanding am i right on that then he says baptizing them comes from the greek word baptizo to immerse someone not just in a flood but to immerse you in a reality such that you are not seen again you are covered and overpowered by whatever it is baptizing them in the name of the father of the son and of the holy ghost 20 teaching them to observe all things that would take more than a crusade to observe all things you go and read the all things jesus taught the people beginning from matthew chapter 5 the beatitudes he taught on money he taught on marriage and relationships am i right on that he taught on demons so when jesus says teach all things do not select what you want to teach jesus already said teach all things mentor the people holistically let them know about satan let them know about god let them know about money let them know about destiny jesus said teach them all things whatsoever i have commanded you and while you do that have this assurance that i am with you all way not always all way even to the end of the earth and like mark he also says amen scripture number three acts chapter one verse six read it acts chapter one verse six reading to eleven i'm showing you the three scriptures that must be put together to understand the corporate mandate of believers wherefore when they therefore were come together this was after the resurrection of jesus they asked him saying lord will thou at this time restore again the kingdom of israel i hope you know that at that time they really did not understand the implication of the death burial and the resurrection of jesus because jesus himself did not really teach them it was paul that came and helped us to understand the things that paul taught were the things jesus said i have many things to tell you but ye cannot bear them now Teaching them all those dynamics would be unfruitful because the Holy Spirit was not in them. So he said, how be it when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you. It was Paul who came and through the Pauline epistle, he brought perspective to the believer's understanding. Without the epistles, we would not understand the full import of redemption nor the benefits to the believer. The gospel is our foundation, but we build upon the knowledge that has come through the epistles are we together so they were all concerned about the restoration of the kingdom of israel and the various stakes that they would have remember when the mother of james and john came to lobby a position for them it was all in pursuit of that agenda and jesus now said it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father has put in his own power but this is what you need to know now eight ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you and then he now says you shall be witnesses the same one who said you will preach the same one who said you will teach now says in addition to that you will be witnesses unto me in jerusalem in judea samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth verse 9 and the Bible says when he had spoken, like Mark saw, like Matthew saw, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Hallelujah. 
So, you have to put Mark's synoptic account, Matthew's synoptic account, and Luke's synoptic account as captured in the book of Acts to be able to give you a holistic picture of the corporate mandate. That way, we now understand the intent of God for the church. Remember, we're looking at our mandate that in spite of our individual assignments and calls, there is a corporate mandate that the moment anyone comes into Christ, among the many foundational things that should be taught the believer is our corporate mandate. This is why we are here. So that everything you receive and everything you know must be connected to that mandate. Hallelujah. So very quickly, let me run through the threefold mandate. And then we'll pray and give room and allow our Father to come and be a blessing to us this morning. There are three components, I said, to the Great Commission. Component number one is called the global harvest. You may call it world evangelization. Please write. The first component of the Great Commission is called the global harvest. global harvest the bible tells us that god desires first and foremost that all men be saved all men there is no guarantee that all men will prosper unfortunately because jesus said the poor you will always have with you are we together now that was not a cause it was a revelation of the stiff-necked nature of men that in spite of all the blessings, some will reject it willingly and God will respect their choice. But then he says that he desires that all men be saved. This was the philosophy that the apostles had. Anyone they saw who was not in the fold, they saw the person as a potential harvest. Now, Jesus in talking about the harvest, he considered every unbeliever as a harvest that was already ripe. The problem was never the harvest. The problem was the scarcity of true laborers. Jesus never, never told us that it was the difficulty of the harvest. It was that the sickle was so blunt. It was so ineffective. He says the harvest is truly plenteous, wide. But the laborers, there are many men, there are many Christians, but there are few laborers. Then he says... Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers. There is an honorable name God calls the believer that believers do not want to be called because it carries a semblance of servitude and weakness. Laborers. So the next time you say the laborer is worthy of his wages, you have to verify what kind of laborer you are. The laborer. Paul was in prison and he was not thinking about his escape. He was thinking about an opportunity to make sure not one soul leaves that prison unsaved. How do I know that? Because when he became free, you would think he would run away. The jailer wanted to kill himself and said, no, no, you'll be a wasted soul. We are not in a hurry to go. Take me to your house. If I came out of a prison like that, I will be out of that city, but not Paul. Paul was in prison and all he was concerned about is the health of the church. Not his exit from the prison. He would write letters from the prison and say, listen, I heard some of you are misbehaving. I'll be out of this place shortly. And when I am out, I assure you, I'm coming to organize a conference and fix up all these things that I'm hearing. This was the philosophy of the early church. Soul winning is not just for evangelists. It's an orientation that every believer must have. Hallelujah. Now, our idea of soul winning, unfortunately, is to put resources together and organize a large crusade and then sit down as helpless people waiting for one man called Joshua Selman, respectfully speaking, called Reinhard Bunker of Blessed Memory, or T.L. Osborne to come and preach. Then we clap as the souls come out. That is wonderful, but it's a, it can be a destructive orientation 
because there are about 8 billion people on earth today and out of the 8 billion people statistic tells us that now there's about 2.8 to 2.6 to 2.8 billion professing Christians that includes backsliders on serious people it's just a statistics that was used it's not verified based on seriousness it's just data as funny as this sounds it should be very disturbing we shout the advantage of the holy spirit in our midst we shout the advantage of technology we boast of the dexterity of the message that we have and yet for all of the ages our civilization has only been able to do justice to 2.6 billion people and yet 10 20 years ago someone designed an app that has brought people embracing that idea in excess of five billion people there are many ideas that have been sold to the world that have been received greater than the message of salvation so a young boy sits down from his garage and designs a technological app and all kinds of people you have never seen him he's never seen you you respect and adore him you even receive updates of the app and you are frustrated when your phone cannot update it and yet a conference of two days is a burden for many believers it then means we have to go back to the lord of the harvest and say something is wrong with our understanding and the kind of jesus we are selling to the nations hallelujah yes the woman at the well when she met with jesus she was so impacted my bible says she left everything there her priorities changed immediately and she ran to the city and said come i know you know me as a prostitute forget that we'll discuss it later but for now come forget about me come come see a man who has told me everything her witness was so compelling people said no no something must have changed about this woman how about the madman in gadara once a madman bound hand and feet in chains but in a moment he went to 10 cities where did he get that energy and why do we not have that same energy today hallelujah the first corporate mandate of the church regardless who you are and what you do you must have it at the back of your mind that there is an expectation from god that all the resources of intellect resources of money resources of access resources of a good voice a beautiful face a well-built body is a waste to the economy of god if it cannot be converted as a tool did you hear what i said it's a waste to the economy of god if it cannot be converted don't tell me you are beautiful don't tell me you are handsome don't tell me you are intelligent don't tell me you are prosperous that does not impress me show me how they have been converted as resources towards the global harvest please sit down Spirit break out Break our walls down Spirit break out Ah Heaven come down Spirit break out Shabbat Shabbat Lakosa de Batia Break our walls down Spirit break out Heaven come down Hallelujah Please help those under the anointing. Listen to me. I'm working with time this morning. Component number one 
if every pastor every prophet every apostle every evangelist sold this idea and this orientation to every believer that soul winning is not something you should be part of it is your assignment you are not helping a preacher win souls you are not helping the church win souls no take away that help mentality and see it as a mandate that support mentality is very destructive for the end time church you are not supporting men of god to win souls no it is our corporate mandate world evangelization that every nation every tribe and every tongue will be compelled to call jesus lord in experience hallelujah and to guarantee that this mission is not aborted the principal in charge is called the holy spirit himself the lord of the harvest his presence is the surety, the guarantee that the nations will be saved. House of Treasure, South Africa, one of these days, we will see a display of God's power to save like we have never seen in church history. I assure you by the Spirit of God, you are talking of revival, you will see an awakening, a move of the Spirit across your land. Hallelujah. I wish I had time. Sit down, let me tell you something the Lord told me. Please sit down. Listen. There are three mysterious ministries that will rise to support this world evangelization agenda. And we must have the discernment to not throw them away. Listen carefully. This was a revelation God gave me. Beware of criticizing the madman in Gadara when you see him preaching. Oh, there are madmen in Gadara who will carry that mandate. You knew him as a madman, but now behold the preacher. Number two, the woman at the well. You knew her to once be a prostitute. Do not reject her when you see her blazing the fire of evangelism. Are we together? There are mysterious ministries. Remember he said, if you do not praise me, I will raise up stones. He was not just talking about literal stones. A stone is inactive. It remains where it is. Based on the law of physics, bodies generally, especially stones, they look lifeless. You keep them there after a thousand years, they are still found there. He says, I can raise up. I will give life to stones. People who don't seem to have destiny and cannot move, I will empower them to stand up and begin to herald this. Number three, the third kind of ministry that God is raising is the ministry of men like Apostle Paul, those who once persecuted the church. Chief persecutors of the church suddenly in their homes an encounter by the Spirit will come. And you will see someone who once was a vocal advocate against God. He will stand and say, the Lord that I once preached is now my savior. Please hear me. South Africa, evangelizing your nation is your responsibility. You will not have to wait for foreigners to come. Mm -mm. It is everybody's business. If we do not take soul winning seriously, hear me, there will be a generation that will arise and corporately reject Jesus. Did you hear what I said? You see, with all due respect, this was the mistake of the West. Whilst their fathers were in the crusade grounds, they left the children at home. And most of these children, they did not call upon the God of their parents. Their parents preached and called upon the name of the Lord till they died. And Satan was patient for two, three, four decades to allow one whole generation pass. Satan can be that patient. 
just because you see him silent in South Africa does not mean he's stupid. He's waiting. He has already gauged the age range of a demography that loves God. And he said, I can't do anything about these people. Let me be patient till they all pass on to glory. Then he will now grow with the children. When Moses told Pharaoh, God had told me to advocate an exodus. Pharaoh said, okay, the men can go. But the wives and the children leave them behind. And Moses said, no way. That was not the plan. Everybody, as for me and my house, as for me and my house, as for me and my company, as for me and my school, as for me and my sphere of influence, it's not me alone, as for me and my children, as for me and the church members. world evangelization let our pulpits be restored to altars that receive sinners back to the fold let our homes become platforms that someone comes for a business meeting and while you are doing business you discern this man has access to 5,000 people and they will worship anything he worships here is your chance to reach 5,000 people in one moment for what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Hallelujah. Listen, I'm praying for you that schools of evangelism will arise in South Africa that will mentor young men and women. Listen, this group of preachers we have rising do not understand God's agenda. I say that with every sense of humility. All that is being sold in the church now is just a display of gifts. And there is nothing wrong with gifts. But gifts without purpose will destroy and wreck our lives. Hallelujah. You secure the support of heaven when you are ever committed to the ministry of soul winning. Sit down, let me give you the other two. We're walking with time. Can I tell you the truth? I honestly don't care how much revelation you know. I don't care the depth of the mysteries that you communicate if I do not see souls saved through it. You quote the Greek, Hebrew, Latin, Aramaic, no matter what you do or do not do, Ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. If I cannot see souls saved through your life, your singing, your doing business, if all you show me is your bank balance, shame on that agenda. If all you show me, I'm not being sarcastic, my apologies for pushing hard on you. If all you tell me is that I'm a rich person, look at my houses, look at my cars, I will clap for you. I will not ignore your sacrifice, but I will truly be disappointed. From an eternal perspective, can I tell you this? Those we call God's generals were first God's evangelists. If you are not ready to do what to be motivated by their pursuit, don't pray for their mantles. We have a careless generation that is obsessed with mantles and power with no assignment, no zeal, no purpose. Most of these people were not in pursuit for power. They truly wanted to see nations saved. And from the simplicity and the childlikeness of their heart, that Lord, if you are looking for a vessel, find me available. The corporate mandate of the church. Can I tell you the truth? When it has to do with soul winning, numbers matter. With all due respect, men of God, let's be careful when we say it doesn't matter. Crowds does not. Mm -mm, mm -mm. For God so loved the world. We're dealing here with men. The price for every one soul in South Africa is the blood of Jesus. Not nine months. The blood of Jesus. Did you hear what I said? The price for every soul in South Africa from an eternal perspective is not a nine-month incubation period. No. 
the blood of Jesus. He desires that all men, including your business partner, all men, including your spouse, who you have slept on the same bed for 20 years with and has never heard about Jesus, all men, including your now teenager children who are about to be destroyed through the decadence that is plaguing our world, I'd rather be considered a failure in life and truly have Jesus and do my best to make him known to my nation and my generation. I believe in prosperity. I believe in increase. I believe in advancement and influence. These are also components of the Great Commission as you'll be learning. But in order of priority, ladies and gentlemen, for many of you who have the call of God upon your life, Apostle, I don't know where to start from. I'm telling you where to start from now. Hallelujah. For many of us who are praying for a church building, Lord, replicate what is in House of Treasures and God says no, until your heart becomes that large. For some of you, God is speaking to you. You've been having these dreams for decades. And God is saying, when will you arise? When will you arise? I have placed a mandate upon you. I have placed a mantle upon you. Can I tell you? For every time you communicate laxity, one soul perishes. Did you hear what I said? This is a matter of life and death. If you lose money, you can make it back. If your house is destroyed, repossessed you can still embrace yourself and get back there are people who are filed for bankruptcy many times who are billionaires today but when a soul perishes my bible your bible says it is appointed unto man to die once and after it the judgment you don't hear these messages on the altar again you've heard me tell my people i am both old and new school both old and new school depending on what you are talking about there are landmarks that we must never allow technology advancement and civilization to erase never make jesus look like a burden to growth a burden to civilization you would think i should not preach this kind of message in a business session this is the proper message for this kind of session and i will not be silent I will always worship as long as When my time is up, I will stop anywhere so that we we'll respect our father and give him room to come up. Go to Europe today. Christianity is not the fastest growing religion. And the religions that are the fastest growing across Europe, you don't see a widespread crusade happening. And yet there are massive conversions happening. Listen, Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in South Africa, we must wake up. In Africa, we must wake up. Otherwise, we will lose a generation. Take what I'm telling you seriously. Hallelujah. Thank God for the flamboyancy around the church. But those things only find their value if they can translate. There is a generation that is building momentum to reject Jesus as a demography. They are coming up as an age range. We choose that will not serve the God of our parents. May it not happen in our lifetime. Did you hear what I said? May it not happen in my lifetime. May it not happen in my lifetime. That a day will come, you will come to church and find only old people. You will come to church and find people only from 45 to 60. And you will find a generation say, you know what? 
we've thought about it we've examined your gospel intelligently and we have chosen as a generation that Jesus is not relevant to our world world evangelism also demands re-examining the Jesus we are presenting there is a Jesus we are presenting to the nations that makes it legitimate to reject him we have presented a powerless Jesus a Jesus who turns men from wisdom to foolishness a wisdom who makes a Jesus who makes fanatics out of people taking away sense and intelligence and development from people's life there must be a restoration we need to represent Jesus Number two, please sit. Please sit. Please sit. There are fathers who spend their lives, they traversed Africa shouting the name of Jesus until they died. We must receive those mantles. We must. Don't just claim people's anointing, claim crowds as a man of God. The Bible says the Lord added daily. Any pastor who is not making altar calls, I respect you, but go back and create changes in your church. Don't say I'm too ashamed if I make the call. What if nobody comes out? It is because of that state that God does not add. Hallelujah. As for me, I have made up my mind that provided I wake up in the morning someone must know Jesus before my head goes back to rest mm. yes sir number two the second component of our corporate mandate as believers is called discipleship the maturity of the saints please write it down I won't talk much about that so that will wrap up the first component is world evangelization do not forget the second component is discipleship do you know what discipleship is discipleship is a system that converts a follower an ignorant person a naive person to reproduce and replicate his master the intent behind discipleship is replication, not information. So the end of your discipleship is not that people know what you know, is that they become a representation of who you are, who should be a representation of who Jesus is. If all you produce in church are knowledgeable believers, you have not done well. You must produce transformed believers. Transformed. Because there is a state where the Bible says ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Hallelujah. Discipleship. We must mentor believers to attain a state of maturity. As powerful as soul winning is, soul winning only gives you access into the kingdom. But now there is one key to the kingdom jesus but when you come into the kingdom there are keys of the kingdom are we together and according to hebrews chapter 6 there are six foundational doctrines that every believer must be methodically guided around if you must become people of stature and power it talks about the doctrine of christ and the foundation of it repentance from dead works faith towards god you list the list goes on and on the word doctrine comes from the latin word doctrina it is a set of truth beliefs information that converts a disciple to become as powerful and as dexterous as his master now i don't know if that happens but please if that happens here but in nigeria where i come from there is a tribe called the Igbo tribe, the Igbo people, the Easterners, right? And they have a system by which they raise people. It's called apprenticeship. So what happens is that 
an individual who is doing business will call a young man probably sent from the village somewhere the countryside and then pragmatically he will be trained to watch his master do business are we together build a clientele for himself while he's doing that supervise for a number of years sometimes a branch and annex and expression of the business will be built somewhere and he will manage it so he learns leadership accountability and all of these things then a time comes um called a time of settlement where the person would have learned for a sufficient time then they call him give him some money and release him to go and start that is an example of discipleship the end of discipleship is not to maintain slaves and members the concept of membership listen to me should never be just ignorant people who just come and watch one man of god keep talking to them it is that those people are turned into matured witnesses who can now be deployed this was the intent behind the local assembly are we together so when you say you are a member of a church, it means by grace and by understanding and by vision, you have identified with a spiritual family as a place for your building, your rising, your making to learn God. But that the end of all that happens in church is that it must be deployed as a tool that helps to win souls and so on and so forth. Discipleship. If we only preach and don't disciple believers, our church will be full of ignorant people who are full of the flesh. There are two main things we are mandated to deal with. Sin and the flesh. You deal with sin in a moment when you confess Jesus. But flesh is a gradual progressive work. And it is dangerous to have people who are saved but not transformed. They will cause trouble for leadership in church. They are the ones who keep coming. You are not sure whether they are saved or not. They really are saved. But it's just that they are not transformed. Because an heir, for as long as he's a child, he differed not from a slave, even though he be lord of all. So the church is full of a lot of children, and some of those children are now appointed to be leaders, and there is a marketing of a lot of carnality. You see that now? Longevity in church does not equal transformation. Transformation happens by the methodical communication of truth. Truth that builds. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they continued steadfastly. This was the apostolic model given to us in the early church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. Let me give you the third. Number three. The third and final component to our corporate mandate is called territorial or societal transformation this is the third component and largely the missing component in the african church the african context of christianity has sold a narrative that has thrown this third component out the gospel that we have sold to the african nation does not carry within a context that transforms society and nations it is the reason why there is a demography rejecting god to this end jesus calls us light he calls us salt not just those given the ministry of reconciliation he says we are the light of the world we are the salt of the earth hallelujah that means when believers understand their mandate they know that there is a portion of this great commission mandate that should influence systems structures the entire territory i hope you know that a territory can be born again just like an individual yes sir god desires that both you and your territory be saved because if you are saved and your territory is not saved you are in trouble ask lot in sodom and gomorrah lot was a man who loved god but because he was among a people a territory that was plunging in decadence his relevance and his light went down 
when this man came and wanted to sodomize the angels he was willing to give up two responsible daughters that is what happens good men will look like evil men in an evil society did you hear what i said good men will look like and even act like evil men if you doubt that god wants to save a territory ask jonah why he ran away he wanted Nineveh, not just the king, the entire territory to be saved. Can territories be saved? Ask Nebuchadnezzar when he passed a decree constitutionally that anybody who spoke anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that he will be cut into pieces. I don't doubt your salvation, but can we say South Africa is saved? Can we say Nigeria is saved? Can we say Ghana is saved? Once upon a time, there was a beautiful nation in the earth that has now become a great nation simply because they made a very powerful statement that God honored. In God, we trust. In God, we trust. Not as an individual, it was a constitutional reality that as a corporate people we have chosen to serve the living God. And God said, this is what you have done. Now let me exalt you above all the nations of the earth. World evangelization. Discipleship and the maturity of the saints. Number three, territorial transformation. This is where government comes. This is where economies come. This is now where the, a business forum like this comes so that you can embrace influence and rise to a position where if possible you are the wealthiest man in South Africa. Imagine the wealthiest man calling upon the name of the Lord. Imagine the wealthiest man rolling on the floor before Jesus. I was honored when I heard Apostle Felix appreciating professors and judges and all of this this is the kind of thing we need and the church must not in ignorance drive these people sometimes we drive people of influence because we say it doesn't matter it is ignorance we need gatekeepers and captains of industry influencers to say yes to jesus because their yes will translate to the yes of many others if i am saved my business will be saved if I am saved, my sphere of influence will most likely be saved. Ladies and gentlemen, it is to this end that God has brought to us all the resources as we'll be learning tonight. So next time you pray and say, God, give me. He says, do you understand why you need what you are looking for? Then you can tell him, yes. I know that all that I ask for is to the end that number one, the nations be saved. Number two, the saints be equipped and matured. Number three, that territories and society be converted and improved. Christianity, when you study revivals and awakenings, every time a revival happened, it translated to education, it translated to civilization improved. Hallelujah. A time should come when the judges, professors should say, we have noticed that Christian students are the best performing students. There is an orientation they have that has translated to academic excellence. We should find out that the most honest, noble judges with integrity, we have noticed, statistically confirmed, that these are people who call upon the name of the Lord. We have noticed that from an economic standpoint, that when people subscribe to the government and the leadership of heaven, it accelerates their being established by 30%, 80% statistically proven now you now see that your christian faith becomes a program that nations can receive are we together that a parliament can sit together and discuss god as an idea that translates to development that even if they reject his person they cannot ignore the idea the impact to society is too great to push it away i have to stop here please rise commissioned 
with power. Now, let me say this before I get back to my seat. Please do not miss tonight. The final door to be connected tonight. And you will see why God has commissioned us with power. Now we have understood the commission. By night we'll come to understand the vast resources that have been made available to the believer. We'll have the time to minister to people tonight to pray. And now you can legitimately ask for impartation and know why when it comes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this session. Thank you for helping us understand our corporate mandate as a people. Now that we know these things, we obtain grace by the Spirit to walk in keeping with these truths. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice here on ground and many who are following by way of internet, television. In the name of Jesus Christ, bring us to this awareness, this consciousness, this orientation that you demand of us and you desire of us to use everything within us to serve your purposes and may we be faithful doing so in the name of jesus amen and amen give jesus a big hand clap celebrate jesus come on come on did you receive the word of the lord come on give jesus give him the praise this morning glory Amen. Hallelujah. What a blessing. Can we celebrate the servant of God? What a word, what a word, what a word. What a word. And I will not be silent. I in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin